only conflict we see is this. Where's my truck? I heard you stole the engine or sold the engine out of my truck. Where's my truck? I heard you sold the engine out of my truck. And for that, this guy massacres three young men, 23, 27, and 30, on their way fishing Friday night near Frostproof. It's gut wrenching. This is evil in the flesh. This is a guy who can hurt you just because it's the right thing for him to do at that moment in time with his three brain cells. And that's the apparent motive in a heinous triple killing out of Frostproof. That's a city located in Polk County, Florida. Welcome to Long Crime Now, everybody. I'm Jesse Weber, and thanks for joining us. So Tony T.J. Wiggins has been charged with murdering three people in cold blood. His brother, Robert Wiggins, and his girlfriend, Mary Whitmore, have been charged with being accessories after the fact. And uh, his brother, Robert, and Mary are both facing $46,000 and $45,000 bond, respectively. However, T.J. Wiggins has been denied bond. Now, the three victims here are Brandon Rollins, Kevin Springfield, and Damian Tillman. They were all killed on a nighttime fishing trip, and now it's time to break down exactly what is going to happen next. I know this is a case that has garnered a lot of attention, so let's discuss. I have an all-star panel with me tonight. Joining me is former federal prosecutor Nima Ramani, long crime legal analyst Terry Austin, and trial attorney and former Philadelphia prosecutor Bernarda Villalona. It's great to have everybody here. Uh, Nima, I want to start with you. How strong is the state's case at this point? And whether you want to say it's ballistics, receipts, uh, witness accounts, you tell me, what do you believe is the strongest piece of the prosecution's case? Or do you feel at this point, maybe it's not strong? You know, there's a very strong case here. You have everything you want as a prosecutor, right? You have your ballistics, executed search warrants, the, um, the weapons found at TJ's residence, match the murder weapon. You have inconsistent statements, right? You have, you know, the murderer, his girlfriend, brother, all saying things to law enforcement that don't match up at all. You have the witness at the dollar store, right, who saw, you know, TJ behind the victim shortly before the murder. And you have, you know, just their attempts to obstruct justice, their attempts to destroy evidence by washing the car down the following day, Really strong case as far as the prosecution is concerned. Doesn't really get much better than this, absent some sort of video evidence or a signed confession. Well, I do want to get into the surveillance footage, but not yet. I want to focus on TJ for a second here. So, Bernarda, this I found interesting. His brother, after apparently they all gave conflicting statements and— uh, mm -hmm. The authority said that both Mary and Robert have not really been cooperating. Uh, but Robert, in a way, was cooperating because he said that his brother is the trigger man. Now, how much do you believe that? Because it's my understanding that the ammunition was taken from these trailers where they lived, and shell casings were tested, and they say that the ammunition was fired from this gun that was found at this trailer. But the question is, at this point, do we know who the trigger man was? And do you have one brother turning on another? And at that point, who do we believe? So, Jesse, that's the problem that we have right here. I disagree with my colleague that the prosecution has a strong case, and this is the reason why. Right now, you have three people that are in custody. All three of them are pointing the finger at each other. There is no surveillance or independent witnesses at the scene that can tell you that Tony Wiggins was the one who fired at these three at these three victims, or that it was Robert Wiggins, or whether it was the girlfriend that fired. All we have right now is circumstantial evidence, and that being the video surveillance from the store and also the firearm and, I'm sorry, the ballistics that was recovered. So I think what the prosecution is going to have to do in this place is going to have to flip one of the three whoever they find the most credible and who they believe is not the trigger person to testify against the trigger person if they want to be successful in this, prostitute, in this prosecution. 
<laughs> and it looks like that Robert uh, seems to be the one who's ultimately speaking more than the rest. But I do want to go into this a little bit. So Sheriff Grady Judd is obviously the one who's been holding this presser. And he gets into more of the timeline of events here. So it's our understanding there was an apparent beef between TJ and one of the victims. This, uh, and it seems that it all happened at this Dollar General store. But let's listen very carefully to the timeline of events laid off by the sheriff. At 2156 hours, we call that 956 in the evening, Damien is checking out of the store with his product. He is followed out of the store by TJ, who checks out about 15 seconds later. And he's also followed by his brother and his girlfriend. At 10.06 p.m., only 10 minutes later, Brandon, who is now in the white pickup truck, frantically calls his dad and says, help. And I've already talked to you how dad ran to the scene only to find the massacre at the scene. What we know is that Damien drove directly to the lake from Dollar General to meet his friends, Kevin and Brandon. What we know is that as a result of that, the murder occurred in short order, in less than 10 minutes. So we have all three of the suspects in the store with Damien and checking out 10 minutes before the frantic call for help. Okay, so let's move a little forward and we're gonna get into the moment of the shooting itself. Back to the sheriff. In now is at the lake and he has met up with, during this time frame, Kevin and Brandon who are in the white truck. And they have turned their trucks so that they're door to door talking to each other in the middle of the road. Robert drives and pulls up behind the white truck that's driven by Kevin with Brandon in the passenger side. TJ exited his truck. When he did, Brandon got out of his vehicle and shined a light back to see who was pulling up behind them. T.J. rushed up to Brandon, pushed him against the truck, pulled the handgun out, and said, where's Kevin? Well, Kevin's sitting in the driver's seat right there. And he looks and sees Kevin. He runs around, he being T.J., runs around between the red truck and the white truck. He points the gun at Kevin and TJ says, where's my truck? Kevin goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, you do. Where's my truck? You sold the engine out of my truck. Ke Kevin said, I don't know what you're talking about. At that moment in time, according to the information we've received, TJ hits Kevin. Damien starts to open the door of his vehicle and is screaming at TJ, put the gun away, put the gun away, put the gun away. TJ's out of control screaming, where's my truck? And he starts shooting Kevin and Brandon inside of the white truck. It's estimated, and this is still under investigation, he shoots him nine to ten times between the two of them. Then he turns on Damien and begins to shoot Damien, who's got his door open, but is in his truck several times. 
Okay, now let's turn to the surveillance footage. We have it up, and what you're gonna see is Damien in the store, in this Dollar General store, and you're gonna see the suspects as well in the store, at least one of them. And this, again, and I wanna turn over to Terry Austin as we watch this, because Terry, this motive, this storyline here, is that no one had a problem with Damien, but that Robert overheard Damien saying he was going to meet Kevin for this fishing trip, reported that back to TJ, and TJ apparently was upset over this stolen engine or this stolen truck, and that is the motive to massacre three people. What do you think about this timeline of events and this story and this motive as we try to piece together what actually happened here? Well, I feel a little bit like the sheriff. I cannot believe that three people are dead because of a truck or an engine from a truck. And frankly, even if Kevin took the engine out of the truck, all of these people dying because of a engine in a truck is really heinous as far as I'm concerned. And the fact that they followed him and ended up fighting with him and ended up shooting all three of them, I really think that I'm happy that there is this circumstantial evidence against these individuals. And I certainly hope that it is prosecuted and that they can make sure they get all the evidence together to convict all of these individuals, particularly TJ, who is the one who apparently pulled the trigger. Now, I sense, you know, there's some disagreement here of whether it's a strong case or not. But, Nima, I want to turn back to you. I think we can all agree this is an absolutely horrific crime. And the question is, does this merit the death penalty? What goes into that conversation regarding what would happen to T.J. Wiggins if, in fact, he is convicted of this? So what is that conversation? And would this kind of case, would this kind of con these kind of convictions merit a death penalty uh, sentence? This is absolutely a death penalty case. You know, you have T.J. Wiggins, rap sheet a mile long, two stints and state prison down there in Florida. Murder, murder never makes sense. But in this particular case, just a brutal execution uh, involving a truck or an engine, whatever the case may be, two innocent people that had nothing to do with whatever dispute there was over this vehicle or the engine or uh, the mechanic work on there. Someone like this, if there is you know, a case that merits the death penalty, this is absolutely that type of case. We're also talking about a defendant who is somebody that has quite the storied criminal career. 230 felonies, 15 convictions, in and out of prison. And when we look at this, we're wondering why exactly was he out? I do want to get to that. But before we do, Bernardo, let me just go back to you about a point. Mary Whitmore, the girlfriend here, charged with being an accessory, the case against her, we have about 30 seconds. What do you think about that? Because what is the strongest evidence that she was an accessory besides the fact that she purchased, allegedly purchased the ammunition for TJ prior to the shooting and, and not even connected to it? Well, my understanding against Mary, it seems that she, the case against her is the weakest. As you can see, Mary is not charged with a homicide and nor is, neither is Robert. And the reason why is because I don't think that the prosecution has any homicide. My understanding uh, is that when Bernardo, Mary I gave we, a statement, I think she we said might have, she was you might have frozen there. I'll tell you what, I do want to get more into Mary Whitmore. I want to talk more about this, but I also want to focus on uh, TJ's criminal career. So let's take a break. When we come back, that's where we'll start. Stay tuned. But this guy is just mean. He's just violent. He's currently out on bond for breaking a guy's arm with a crowbar during a fight, waiting to go back to trial on other felony charges. This is a guy who they said will just walk up and punch you for no reason, or no reason to you, certainly a good reason to him. You look at the Florida statutes, as it appears with criminal conduct, he's got some arrest history. Everything from burglary and theft to aggravated battery 
to resisting law enforcement officers, to battery on law enforcement officers, to battery on people that are 65 years or older, the elderly. He's just wild and hostile. And the people of Frostproof said, look at him. History? We're talking about T.J. Wiggins, the guy who was just arrested and charged with murdering three people. This is a guy who had 230 felonies, 15 convictions in and out of prison. Terry, let me turn it to you. How was he out? How is it possible he was out allowed to literally do whatever it is he wanted to do? That was absolutely a mistake. I don't know how he was let out. He should have absolutely been in jail. He has been convicted multiple times, and these have been violent convictions. They were felonies. And the fact that he was able to commit this heinous crime, killing three different people, it just shows you that when you are looking at bail considerations, that it is very important to look at what the criminal history is. And here, he has obviously a propensity to commit crimes, and he should have never been let out of jail. Nima, what are you looking out for next in this case? Because it has gotten a lot of attention, uh, especially since the, with the arrest of these three people. Uh, what are you looking out for next about maybe from the state or maybe even the defense? I don't know. There's much of a defense here. You know, the state has a very strong case, as I mentioned. You know, this is a small town, three or 4,000 people outside Orlando. This is not, you know, a big city um, the sheriff there has been sheriff, I believe, for almost 50 years. So, you know, I expect the state to go after TJ, and it's going to be a life or a capital case. Um, there's no question in my mind. And then as far as the other folks, um, I do think there's strong evidence for accessory after the fact for obstruction, and maybe even enough to tie them in on some conspiracy or an aiding and abetting. They all drove there together, I believe, with— the intent to commit some sort of felony, right? Whether to, you know, rough these guys up or anything. So you may even be able to get, you know, the girlfriend and the brother on felony murder. So I hope and I trust that the state of Florida will go after all three of these individuals very aggressively. But as far as evidence, um, I think they have what they need to get convictions but here. But Bernardo, let me jump on that for a second. Uh, the, the other two, Robert and Mary, were they just unwittingly a part of this? Because mm -hmm. TJ was the one who told Robert, allegedly, to make the turn. He's the one who got into the confrontation. And then he, after shooting, allegedly shooting these three people, had Robert help him move one of the bodies. I mean, is there a way that Robert and Mary could get out of this and say, we really didn't know what he was doing? We didn't know what we were a part of? Well, that is the issue right there. I don't think that the prosecution has enough evidence to show that Robert or Mary had the mental state of mind or intent to participate in this homicide. And that's why they haven't been charged as such. And now they just be in charge with accessory after the fact, because that is what they can prove. I think that's the problem. But then again, remember that they can later charge them. They don't have to charge them with the homicide well, Bernard, now. If Mary is not cooperating more. with authorities, is that enough for accessory after the fact? Well, uh, accessory after the fact for her, she also was inside of the car and went to purchase, I believe, some right. of the ballistics right. that was actually used in the homicide. So using that video from that purchase, and trying to track that down, I believe that would be enough, at least right. for accessory after the fact. So I want to get into more of the emotional element of this. The sheriff recounted how Brandon Rollins called his father. Listen very carefully, carefully to this. I mean, this is just absolutely heartbreaking. Brandon called his father 10 minutes after they left the store. That's, so that means they left the store he met his buddies, they're talking, the suspects pull up. Whether Brandon, I imagine, all information I have is he made the call when the argument started. Because by the time dad got there and found his son on the ground, gasping his last breaths, and he's holding his son He's with his son during the very end of his life, and he's panicked. As I told you, he ran to the store, and people 
Good question. Well, why didn't he just pick up his son's cell phone and call? Well, his son's phone had fallen down inside the truck. And in his panic and fear, he didn't see any cell phones. He just knew the three, the three boys and his son were shot to pieces, and he ran for help, which is all he knew to do. We've tried to comfort Dad. The wounds were so severe that quite literally, if an emergency room had been across the street, they couldn't have saved his life. But you can't imagine the horror of a dad to find his son shot up. I don't mean shot, I mean shot up, as we say in Polk County vernacular. Multiple gunshots and dying in your arms. Just absolutely awful when you think about that. Look, this is a case we're going to continue to follow here on Long Crime Now, but I want to move on to a different one, and this is out of Georgia. A man named Dennis Perry has been officially released from prison after spending 20 years behind bars for killings that he may not have committed. So back in 2003, Perry was convicted of murdering Harold and Thelma Swain, and he had agreed to waive his rights to an appeal in order to avoid the death penalty, but he always said he was innocent. Now, because of this new DNA evidence that was recovered and pointing to, our, to an alternative suspect, as well as the fact that uh, a key witness in his trial, it came out that she might not have been that credible, a judge has thrown out his conviction and released him on bond awaiting a new trial. I want to actually go to a portion of this hearing when you'll learn a little bit more about Mr. Perry. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. The court has had an opportunity to read the trial transcript related to this case in which the state put forward their evidence against Mr. Perry. And the court has also had the opportunity to hear new information and evidence that has come to light since that time. But what we have not yet had the opportunity to do is to introduce you, Your Honor, to the man who is our client, Mr. Dennis Perry. And we'd like to take an opportunity to do that today. Right. Mr. Dennis Perry is a 58-year-old man. He's a loving husband. He's known as Papa Sunshine to his grandchildren. He has no history in his 58 years of violence. His criminal history includes two misdemeanor charges from when he was in his 20s. Otherwise, there is nothing there. He is a skilled craftsman and a woodworker. As the court saw in the certificates that we provided as part of our bond motion, and as the court saw with the photographs of the woodworking that Mr. Perry has done from Coffee Correctional during his incarceration. Mr. Perry has been wrongfully imprisoned for over 20 years. He has been deprived of his freedom and locked away from his family. During his imprisonment, Mr. Perry could have and understandably could have become bitter, angry, or even vengeful, but he is not. Mr. Perry has chosen a different path. Mr. Perry has used his time in prison to educate himself, to deepen his faith in God, to develop his carpentry and woodworking skills, and to nourish his family connections remotely from prison. Okay, Nima, I wanna to turn to you. This you don't see every day, and I'm curious what's going to happen next. The state clearly objected to this, and one of the things they said was, this is a guy who waived his rights to an appeal. It's not fair that he gets a new trial. And the question is, do they retry him? I ask you this because, especially in light of all this evidence coming forward that he might not have done this, but number two, my understanding is the parole board had agreed, or at least conditionally agreed, to a tentative release of him in September. So we're talking about two months from now. Mm -hmm. What is going to happen here? Do you think the state is really going to retry him? I don't think they will. And frankly, their conduct over the past 20 years is offensive, and it's offensive now. You know, you have a district attorney who prosecuted this case knowing that really the only witness here, the only one, was paid 
twelve thousand dollars as a reward. And this is, you know, Perry's, I believe, ex girlfriend's mother. But there's no other evidence implicating him with this murder. In fact, there's another suspect whose DNA was at the scene and who for two decades has bragged to multiple people about killing the Swains and using racial slurs. So the fact that the district attorney's office opposed this motion, the fact that they used this appellate waiver, which is pretty standard um, in death penalty cases when the state doesn't pursue the death penalty, as a basis to deny an actually innocent person um, the right to be freed after spending two decades in prison, um, offensive. There's no evidence in this case to support a new trial. And I got to, you know, really applaud the Georgia Innocent Project and, you know, King and Spalding and really the Atlanta Journal Constitution, right. everyone that was involved in helping secure yeah, Mr. Perry. That's freedom. what they're designed to do. This is, a, this is a huge win. But now that, Terry, the question becomes, okay, let's not talk about a case against Perry. What about a case against Eric Spare? And this is, again, the alternative suspect that these eyeglasses, the DNA might match him, or it seems to match him. And the question is, this is somebody who was initially ruled out by investigators, and yet, allegedly, he had confessed to this. No charges have been filed against him. What happens to him, Terry? Well, I definitely think that he should be pursued as a, you know, suspect here because of the DNA evidence and the fact that he has talked about these, you know, horrible crimes. I think is even more reason that the DA should have from the very beginning been looking at him. And certainly now they should yeah. be looking at him with his DNA. Yeah, this is, again, not something you see every day, but my gosh, what an amazing legal development. One, we'll see what the next steps are. Uh, Nima, I want to thank you for coming on. When we come back, new update for you. You might have heard of her. Ghislaine Maxwell, a lot to talk about. Stay tuned. And welcome back, everybody. It's time to talk about Ghislaine Maxwell, Jeffrey Epstein's alleged accomplice who's been charged with recruiting minors to be sexually abused and then lying about it under oath. Now, Clearly, there's always a lot to talk about with her, but right now, a federal judge has ruled that previously sealed documents detailing a lot of information can be released. Now, this is all in regards to a prior lawsuit that was filed against her. But the question is, what do these documents reveal? It's been reported that they might reveal details of her sex life. It's also been reported that perhaps it will show she lied under oath about what she knew about what was going on with Jeffrey Epstein. And we're going to get into that in a second. But if you want a sampling of what we're dealing with here, listen again to Audrey Strauss, again, the U.S. attorney from the Southern District of New York, who spoke about Ghislaine Maxwell when she was arrested. Maxwell was among Epstein's closest associates and helped him exploit girls who were as young as 14 years old. Maxwell played a critical role in helping Epstein to identify, befriend, and groom minor victims for abuse. In some cases, Maxwell participated in the abuse herself. As alleged, Maxwell and Epstein had a method. Typically, they would befriend these young girls by asking them questions about their lives, pretending to be taking an interest in them. They would take them to the movies and treat them to shopping trips. Maxwell would encourage these young girls to accept offers from Epstein to pay for their travel and their education, making these young victims feel indebted to Jeffrey Epstein. After developing a rapport with the victims, Maxwell then tried to normalize sexual abuse with a minor victim through a process known as grooming. For example, Maxwell would discuss sexual topics with the victim and undress in front of the victim or be present for sex acts involving the minor victims and Epstein. Maxwell's presence as an adult woman helped put the victims at ease. As Maxwell and Epstein intended, this grooming process left the minor victims susceptible to sexual abuse. 
All right, Bernardo, let me start with you. You know what I'm going to ask you. What are we expecting to find in these soon to be or possibly revealed, possibly soon to be released documents? I say that because a judge has allowed a temporary stay of this release, allowing the Ghislaine Maxwell's lawyers to appeal that. Um, but what do you think we're going to find if the, when these documents or if these documents are released? Jesse, I think what we're going to find is a whole bunch of bombshells. I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that are scared of what's going to come out from these documents. So I am sure that there are people that are praying that these documents do not become unsealed. But the public is going to have a front row seat as to the background of this woman, as well as Jeffrey Epstein, the nastiness, the disgusting nature of these two, how they took young females, young girls, and took advantage of them. Terry, the, her attorneys obviously objected to this. The question is why? Was it just because we want to shield her from embarrassing details coming forward, or is there something else there that they don't want revealed? What could that be? Well, she's claiming that these are personal you know, information and that it's a criminal proceeding and this is a civil proceeding, so we shouldn't be able to see the evidence. But the judge isn't listening to all of that. And so I really believe that, you know, these pieces of information are going to be more probative than prejudicial. And I do believe that at the end of the day, they're not only going to be able to be introduced into evidence in this case, but I do think that ultimately because of the public value of wanting to See all of this, it will ultimately be released. And I think there will be some bombshells in there. So I agree with Bernarda, but I also think that it's going to show what, in fact, Jeffrey Epstein and Maxwell did as far as these young girls were concerned. I don't know, embarrassing, humiliating. She's been arrested and charged, and she's currently in custody for allegedly sex trafficking minors. I mean, what more could be embarrassing coming out from that? But, Bernarda, the defense, her attorneys, are trying to fight this, and they've been granted a, st uh, a stay of this publication, a release of these documents, in order to appeal. The likelihood that a higher court, the Second Circuit, would ultimately say, no, we're not going to unseal these documents? I highly doubt, Jesse, that that's going to happen. Remember in the Bill Cosby case that they actually unsealed the civil dis, uh, depositions that were taken. And in one of those depositions, remember, there was an admission by Bill Cosby that he said that he had drugs and women um, in his past. So mm -hmm. I think same as in the Bill Cosby case, a Second Circuit Court judge is not going to overrule the district court. And just remember, the under the First Amendment, we have a right to public information. The people have a right to public information. And then under the Sixth Amendment, remember that Giselle McPhee is going to have that Sixth Amendment right of a public and fair trial. So this information is going to either come out now or it's going to come out during the trial. It's just a matter of time. And let's not forget, more directly right now, she is accused of lying in her deposition about knowing what Jeffrey Epstein was allegedly involved in. That's her main concern. Don't forget, two counts of perjury there. Now, talking mm -hmm. about these high-profile figures, as we talked about here on Law and Crime, now on our last show, President Donald Trump weighed in on Ghislaine Maxwell. Or really, not that quite. I mean, he did offer a sort of response, and then his people came back with a response to his response. Let's first go to Donald Trump to, uh, talking about Ghislaine Maxwell in this presser. Ghislaine Maxwell is in prison, and so a lot of people want to know if she's going to turn in powerful people. And I know you've talked in the past about Prince Andrew, and uh, you've criticized Bill Clinton's behavior. I'm wondering, uh, do you feel that she's going to turn in powerful men? How do you see that working out? I don't know. I haven't really been following it too much. I just wish her well, frankly. Uh, I've met her numerous times over the years, especially since I lived in Palm Beach. And I guess they lived in Palm Beach. Uh, but I wish her well. Whatever it is, uh, I don't know the situation with Prince Andrew. Just don't know. Not aware of it. Okay, now, Terry, obviously people thought this was a very strange comment to make and also a curious comment to make, considering President Trump, as well as Prince Andrew and Bill Clinton, have been accused of being uh, within Jeffrey Epstein's orbit and possibly partaking in these illegal activities. Obviously, nothing has been, uh, no evidence has come forward to ultimately confirm that, and no one has been charged yet, but they thought this was an interesting response. Now, in response to what he said, his spokesperson said, 
Well, when he said, "Wish her, I just want her to be uh, well, I wish her well, I want, he, they said that he meant, I want her to be safe, that she's ultimately protected in prison. What do you think of that explanation for what the president said? Not good enough, Jesse. Here's the problem. It should have been a more prejudicial statement. Instead of saying, I wish her well, or I don't know about the case, what he should have said was, listen, this is an ongoing case. I don't want to comment on it. You know, if in fact there are claims that turn out to be true, I hope that she's prosecuted. And if not, I hope that she, you know, avails herself of the law. And if she's proven innocent, you know, instead of saying, I wish her well, he should have said something more prejudicial and something more benign than what he actually said. And I don't believe what a spokesperson said. Uh, so, you know, I, I think uh, when he's not commenting and reading a statement, yeah. we have to wonder what he's saying. Look, at the end of the day, there is no denying the fact that her life is in danger. She's the only one at the top of this pyramid who has all this information. So I think we can all agree. We hope she is kept safe in prison because she is the the person that we need to turn to for all of this information. Uh, well, let's take a break. When we come back, we have to focus on two developments in two major cases, Ahmad Arbery and Tiger King. We'll be back. We think Glenn County certainly shares liability in the, in the murder of Ahmaud Arbery, uh, specifically for their role uh, in, in officers telling the family, or I'm sorry, encouraging that neighborhood of Santilla Shores to rely on vigilante justice, to rely on their neighbors as opposed to the law enforcement officers who, who, were, who, who are trained to deal with suspicions of crime. Um, um, and, and certainly for the McMichaels, they're relying on the defense. That's Lee Merritt, one of the attorneys representing the family of Ahmad Arbery, who was gunned down in Georgia, announcing that a lawsuit will be filed against the Glynn County Police Department. And uh, again, although three men have been charged in the killing, as you just heard, they believe that there are more to blame for this. So, uh, Terry, let me start with you. That's a big claim, that the Glynn County Police Department, this is not a police-involved uh, killing, that they are to blame here, because the idea is that they encouraged neighbors to contact the McMichaels if they were in trouble. That this kind of citizen's arrest, this kind of vigilante justice, as you just heard, that what they did was wrong. Do you think that holds water? Well, it might, Jesse. I mean, this is a wrongful death action, and they may be stretching it a little bit, but I do think that they are trying to hold the authorities responsible for this death because they have created this sort of environment where people are, you know, sort of provoked into this civil vigilante sort of atmosphere. And the fact that the McMichaels actually did, in fact, go after Ahmaud Arbery when he was, you know, jogging and that people were calling in, I do think that there is, it might be a stretch, but I do think that there is some claim that they should, the county should be held responsible here in creating this sort of atmosphere. Well, Merritt also said, and Bernard, I want to turn to you, he also said that the former district attorneys who are on this case, Jackie Johnson and George Barnhill, are being investigated by the FBI mm -hmm. because they refused to ultimately file charges here. Now, I don't know if that adds into the lawsuit or affects the lawsuit, but that's a big fact to consider here. How do you think that that's going to play out? Because, again, the overall narrative here, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that there was a cover-up. There was a cover-up to protect the McMichaels. So, Jesse, if you recall, remember that this investigation went through a couple of hands before it was ultimately investigated and prosecuted by the attorney general's office. So what I think how it's going to affect the civil suit is that the investigation is going to produce a lot of documents, a lot of discovery that may be able to assist the civil suit. So what Lee Merritt is referring to is that there was a text message that has come to light and that has been saved between the homeowner of where Ahmad Arbery uh, entered and also yep. some law enforcement. And in that, the law right. enforcement told the homeowner to refer or to go to, uh, to, to this family 
if they needed some help or surveillance. But that homeowner never reached out to the McMichaels or gave the McMichaels permission to act as law enforcement on his behalf. And the homeowner has gone on record with saying that. Well, uh, Terry, uh, let me ask you a quick, real 30 seconds here. Th the idea, though, that the McMichaels might use that as a defense, hey, we police said we they, people could come to us. We thought we were in the clear. We didn't do anything wrong. We had probable cause to believe that Ahmad Arbery was a burglar. Is that any way of a defense? Well, they're going to claim that, Jesse, but I don't think it's going to work because he committed no crime. He walked into a house. The homeowner had no problem with it, and he's jogging down the street. So I think they may try to claim that, but there was no crime being committed, so they had no right to go after him. And we got a sense of the defenses during that bond hearing. Uh, again, a big case that we will continue to cover. We'll see which way this lawsuit unfolds. Now, before we wrap up, we have to talk about a case that we haven't talked about in a while. It's not even a case. It's a story. Let's go back to Tiger King. So you might have, anybody who watched the Netflix series might remember Kelsey Saf Safari. She, uh, excuse me, he used to work for Joe Exotic Zoo and was attacked by a tiger. And her, his arm had to be amputated. Really incredible stuff that we're talking about here. Well, now he's doing an ad for a personal injury law firm out in Georgia called Bader Scott, and it's uh, regarding workers' compensation. Listen very carefully to what uh, Saf had to say in this commercial. My job options definitely are narrow. You know, they, there's a lot of jobs that I just physically cannot do. Yeah, I did not see workers' compensation. Um, at the time, it was literally the last thing on my mind. I was able to work with those animals, and that was my reward. That was my payment. You know, that's just how I felt at the time. Um, I still feel that way. I was able to live my dream, and I would have done anything, including cut off my left hand to do so. It was just something I was able to do. It was a privilege for me to be able to return to work without compensation and to continue the work that I was doing prior to that, up until that point. A lot of Americans don't have that privilege, you know? So that's, that's it. I just got lucky, man, I really did. The guy who got his hand bit off by a tiger got lucky because I know deep down that it was for the animals that I went immediately back and kind of put everything else to the back burner, including the fact that I'm having to, to live life one-handed at the time. I do believe that it, if it had happened in any other situation, I would have definitely seeked proper compensation. Now, Bernardo, this is really sad, but at the end of the day, do you think this was a genius move on the part of the law firm to feature him? Jesse, all I have to say is money, 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 because both the law firm and staff <laughs> are going to make a lot of money off of this. I actually think it was genius in using staff as the main point person for this commercial and also as an educational tool for people out there and seeking compensation, whether it's a personal injury or from workers' comp. Yeah, and Terry, I mean, at the end of the day, he had a real claim there, but he, you know, he said that he didn't think about it at the time, just really wanted to get back to the Tigers. I mean, he's really the hero of the whole Tiger King story. If you watch it, everybody was like, I wish we could all be like him. Return to work five days later after getting the arm amputated. What are your thoughts, Terry? Listen, I agree with Bernardo. As a former PR, you know, professor, this was genius. The fact that he goes on and he is just so humble and innocent and says, you know, I would have never sued. In fact, I'm so lucky to have a job. I mean, people sort of feel for him. We already know that people are sympathetic to what happened to him and the fact that he's just so grateful to have a job. So at the end of the day, when you watch the commercial, basically what he's saying is, look, do as I say, not what as I did, because, yeah. you know, he didn't do, but he's saying that others should. So I think it was very effective. Very effective. Curious if Joe Exotic watched it, had an opportunity to see it. But, uh, you know, I, I guarantee a lot of people clicking on the Bader Scott website after that commercial. So we wish Saf all the best. Bernarda, Terry, thank you so much for coming on to Long Crime. Now, everybody out there, please be safe. And we will see you next time.